Hey, YouTube's gonna cooperate tonight. Wow. Ooh, I, I hit go live indeed. and like within 30 seconds, it's like, hey, we can do this. We're we're good. Awesome. No more waiting 60 seconds. Hey! <laughs> we are live. All right. Welcome to Talking Heads, everyone. Episode 274. Your once week live live. Ugh. Your once weekly good lord. Live show. Once weekly live show How for the latest in beer and tech news. And, and tech news. I think. I'm John. I'm Jeff. <laughs> right? Uh, That's how this let me see if I can pick this up. <laughs> Welcome to Talking Heads, everyone. Episode 274, your once weekly live show for the latest in beer and tech news. I'm Jeff. I'm John. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us on this Wednesday night or in podcast form over on Anchor.fm or wherever your favorite podcasts are found. If you've never seen the show before, we talk beer, we talk tech, we talk games, pop culture, entertainment, usually some Star Trek. All Super Chats are read on the air so long as they will not permanently demonetize the channel. We do drink alcohol on the show, and if you're drinking along with us, alcoholic or not, let us know in the chat and we'll give some early show shoutouts as we go along. Last but not least, if you'd like to take part in the super secret chat and the even more super secret after party, think about joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can talk with myself, John, Rhett, Steve, all the hosts from Talking Heads, and join the awesome community that hangs out over there. Okay. Very wonderful community. Now I'm on. <laughs> all right. We're back on it. Woo. I, have I finally no, set up all my... I have no idea what happened there. Just... <laughs> <laughs> I was telling John right before the show that I'm kind of like a walking zombie at this point. Um... <laughs> Both of my littles have ear infections, like double ear infections, like leaking out their eye holes, ear infections. Uh. It, oh. Yeah, it has been, it has been an experience. <laughs> uh, told my wife when I was, uh, when we were considering having a, a third kid, I went, you know, I'm okay playing man to man. I'm not so sure about the switch to, to a, a zone defense. And... <laughs> And man, this week has been all about that. <laughs> but that's what the dogs are for, right? Right. The dogs are just a deep cover too. Like, <laughs> like if the kids get out in a parking lot, it's like go go run them down. Like make sure they're, you know. But your job as a parent anymore, once you have three or more kids, is just try not to get beat over the top. <laughs> Keep everything in front of you. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, like, just go, 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 go. Yeah. Just hope you survive. Yeah, exactly. So, but we are both embarking on some interesting journeys this month. Uh, we have both yes. done this, uh, our, our individual things, but it's never mm -hmm. coincided in the same year. Uh, no. So, Wednesday, uh, or Wednesday, March in Craft Computing is going to be Mixology March! Ah, ah. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, <laughs> cocktails, all month long. Uh, cocktails were my first love. I still absolutely thoroughly enjoy making cocktails. Uh, and so I'm going to indulge myself in, in that, uh, in every single video and live show during the month. Uh, no beer on the channel whatsoever, except when John is on, because John hey. is doing his own 31 day challenge. John, you want to tell yes. us a little bit about what yours is? Yes, uh, I started doing this last year and I did uh, an all beer diet. Uh, and so I'm going to do kind of that again. Uh, it's a slight modification, but um, just for scientific reasons, I might switch back to the other one next year, but mm -hmm. for now, 99% of my calorie intake will be coming in only from beer. So if you are interested in that, uh, it is a spinoff of a 500-year-old Bavarian monk Lent diet. So if you want to learn more about that and all the cool things about that, come check out my channel, Hops and Brews. Um, this year, I'm going to be doing a lot more shorts and uh, TikToks and YouTube shorts and stuff like that, just what I'm drinking. Um, so go check that out. 
Yes. And uh, sorry, I forgot to update the placard. So your red is awesome right now. There we go. Got you switched back. Basically. There we I, go. I'm both. I mean, I mean, red is awesome. It, it, yeah, it, wasn't, yeah, it was just a statement. Like, come on. <laughs> uh, when is Rhett coming back on? I miss him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we do have a couple of super chats to start things off. First off with his uh, traditional two Aussie bucks. Thank you so much, Cran. Good night, mates. Uh, as always, I'm not Jeff. Uh, good to see you, Cran. As always. Tech Geek sends over $50. Uh, evening, Jeff and John. Another day off today, so I get to catch you live. I am also in the middle of a Google Meet call with friends, and I'm dragging them into this too. Cheers, guys. We'll give them to give us 50 bucks too. Like, like proof yeah, that you have great. friends, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's right now creating more YouTube accounts. Oh, uh, right. here we go. <laughs> this will show Jeff. Tech Geek 01, 02. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm on to Tech your Geek. alts, my friend. <laughs> Uh, it's going to be a great show. Uh, let's see. What kind of news do we have? TikTok is setting a 60-minute daily limit for accounts under the age of 18. Uh, Ford has patented a technology that will repossess itself. <laughs> uh, and the FBI now recommends you use ad blocker. Uh, that and Shocking. more. Right. That and more coming up. Uh but first off, let's get this show absolutely started the right way. John, what are you drinking? And while you're kind of explaining it, I'm going to get a couple of basic supplies ready to roll on my end. So take it All away. All right. Uh, recently, actually, it was pretty cool. I went and got a new washer and dryer set up and um, found this uh, washer in uh, uh, Washington. And ended up going there, and the guy was like, oh, I recognize you. You look familiar. And then five minutes go by. It's like, oh, I have a YouTube channel. Blah, blah. Five minutes go by. It's like, you're the beer diet guy. And he ended up being the owner of Trapdoor Brewing, and he decided to give me a bunch of beers. So today, a big shout out to Trapdoor Brewing, and I'm going to be having their uh, juiced up double New England style IPA. So... It's got lots of cool pineapples, but uh, he and his brother own, or uh, he owns Trapdoor, and his brother owns uh, Bearlick Brewing in Portland. So both, I truly love their beers. They're fantastic. Again, shout out to Trapdoor. If you're in the Pacific Northwest, Ooh. take a look. Yes, Trapdoor is awesome. Right up the nose. <laughs> <laughs> like I've done this before. <laughs> ah, I didn't realize that 99% of your calories were going to be inhaled. Well, I mean, it's just like, that's the most efficient way, actually. <laughs> didn't know that. All right. Uh, so, <laughs> normally I would start off uh, cocktail month, mixology March, with an old fashioned because classic, classic. It, it's my favorite cocktail. Um, yep. This time I am deviating from that ever so slightly with my own rendition of an old fashioned um i call this a gin old fashioned although it is kind of half oh i forgot a lime hold on let me go lime there so I am riffing, not necessarily off the old fashioned itself, but more off of the improved whiskey cocktail, which was a cocktail in the, the 30s and 40s that was based off the original whiskey cocktail, which was like whiskey and, and a little bit of sugar and it was served warm. And uh, then they started adding like fruit and other spirits and other types of mixers. And it became, you know, this improved whiskey cocktail, kind of the way we think of uh, like a Bloody Mary today, where you can serve it with a side of onion rings and a slice of pizza on top and still call it a cocktail. Nice. Um, and it was just getting over the top. And it got to the point where people said, I'd like a whiskey cocktail, but just make it old fashioned, just rock, whiskey, sugar, bitters, stir. Like that's that's about as simple of a cocktail as you can get. Um, I like taking that idea and applying it to other liquors and trying to bring out specific spirits and notes in other liquors. And this 
is, like I said, what I call a gin old fashioned. It's kind of halfway between that improved whiskey cocktail and maybe a gin martini. Uh, okay. So for this, I like to use a barrel finished or barrel aged gin. Uh, so you get something with a little bit of color to it. Uh, this is uh, Catoctin Creek. This was sent over to the channel by uh, GI Pilot. So shout out GI. Uh, this is some amazing stuff. Uh, this is a uh, 92 proof gin. It's an American gin that was aged in rye barrels. And it's amazing. Uh, my other favorite is from Big Bottom Distillery right here in uh, McMinnville, Oregon. They make the Big Bottom Barrel Finish Gin. And uh, it has all the right notes for what I wanted to bring out in this cocktail. Anyway, so we're going to do two and a half ounces of the Catoctin Barrel Finished Rye. See, you need you need like an overhead camera. I I was going to set one up, but then I completely forgot about it, and and until like four minutes before the show, and it's like, yeah, I don't really have time. So we're uh, <laughs> we're putting this all into a giant uh, mixing vessel. So two and a half ounces of our Catoctin Creek rye. This is where it gets a little weird, and uh, some people may love it, and some people may hate it. But uh, I'm going to add. A splash of Midori, a, a splash of uh, melon liqueur, just a quarter ounce. Um, are, are you doing that over the simple syrup sweetener? Nope. Nope. A little bit of simple no. syrup, too. Yep. Okay. Uh, half okay. ounce of simple. It's, it's kind of in addition to the simple syrup, where I would normally, for like two and a half to three ounces of, of liquor, do like three quarter ounce of simple. Uh, this I do a half a simple and a quarter ounce of the Midori. Okay. Splitting it. Right. So half an ounce of simple syrup. And then we're going to add juice from half of a lime. So just take your lime, squeeze it on in there. That is one holy crap juicy lime. <laughs> there we go. So that's what kind of you're left with. And we give this a little bit of a It stir. looks like Mountain Dew. It really does. It's really the same color as Mountain Dew. It, it's kind of unsettling you're, how much yeah, it is. Which is actually the original uh, old whiskey drink. Right. So it, yeah. Look. There's yeah. A Mountain Dew there. was originally meant to be a mixer for whiskey. It, it was literally the, the old mascot for Mountain Dew was a was a moonshiner in overalls. Like yeah. it, it was not a thinly veiled thing. It was no pour your moonshine into Mountain Dew. Which is another name for moonshine. So there you go. The more you know. Uh, and I'm going to loosely strain this into a rocks glass with one giant rock in it. And there we go. That is what I call the gin old fashioned. As my uh, strainer falls off the top of my mixer. Now, are you going to, for this month, uh, release all of your recipes either in the uh, Discord or description? Yes. Yes. So uh, for Talking Heads, it's been a little bit difficult because I, I typically don't go back and add those. But uh, yeah. maybe I'll shoot a couple Craft Extra videos for the Talking Heads recipes and, and I'll throw them up there. That would, that would be pretty fun to do uh, yeah. the craft extra episodes of like you making the either previous week's talking heads cocktail, mm -hmm. you know, something like that or, or the upcoming. So if people right. want to drink it along with you. Yep. So that would be pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, this does end up being a fairly sweet drink. Uh, but with the barrel finished rye, uh, you do get, or barrel finished gin, excuse me. Rye, you get some you get some oaky notes coming out. You get some uh, a lot of juniper. Uh, the the melon mm. liqueur, I feel, brings the the juniper right dead center, dead front and center, and the barrel aging gives it 
just a little spiciness. And then it finishes very, very sweet. Uh, this is really good. G Pilot just says you just switch the glass to actually Mountain Dew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's my secret. Is I I've never actually had alcohol ever. Uh, <laughs> it's all sleight of hand. <laughs> all right, let's see. We got a couple. Uh, I think Jeff's trying to hype me up to make a penicillin. That's a fantastic, good, uh, good old cocktail. Uh, did I get the recipe from Chat G GPT? No, I actually made this recipe probably like six or seven years ago, um, and uh, I think I've actually had it on the channel once before, but I cannot find what episode it was. It was in the downstairs studio of my old house. Uh, you made you made a cocktail once with the barrel aged gin, but I don't remember if you called it an old fashioned. I do remember like a barrel aged gin before. Yeah, and and I know I've had that gin in quite a few different things over the years, but uh, but this in particular, I thought I had made this once, but I couldn't find any reference to it on the channel. So, ah, oh, I'm glad March is here. So good. <laughs> The question is, are you going to only drink cocktails and then therefore nothing else? No water, no nothing. Let's see how your liver can handle it. Right. Um, the problem <laughs> That's with, a true mixology mark. The problem with cocktails is at their heart, they're just spirits, which is distilled uh, ethanol. Uh, there is caloric content there, but there's no nutrients at all <laughs> it is <laughs> ethanol and water and and tinges of other flavors and i mean you could what if i mean well you you have lime juice so there's technically some vitamin c in there yes yes uh you could start making margaritas or tequila sunrises mm -hmm. uh mimosas is that technically a cocktail mimosa is a cocktail but that's uh orange juice and champagne um, yeah, but so so you have some vitamin C. Yeah, a little. So there. I don't know if I mean, it would it... work though. <laughs> like like in a beer, you get so much. You... We talked about this before. Like a beer is basically a sandwich. Uh, yeah, it's just bread. It's just bread. Um, and so there's there's actually a lot more nutrients in beer than there are in spirits, even if you add other things to it. You know, even if I make a Bloody Mary, it's, it, you know, it's mostly tomato juice. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's still two ounces of vodka. <laughs> if I added vodka to my sandwich, would it taste like my beer? Mm. I wonder. <laughs> uh, well, there's a video for you. There's a video right there because it's just li uh, <laughs> liquor and bread. <laughs> That's a stupid video. That sounds like something I do. Yep, it's the alcoholic Mountain Dew. Luckily, it tastes nothing like Mountain Dew. Uh, but it is just, I like this cocktail. This is one of my favorites to make. Oh yeah. Protein in the egg whites. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I do like me a, a good amaretto sour Boston style, Yeah. you know, shake an egg white in your cocktail. That is some good stuff there. Uh, all right. Andrew's drinking a... Imperial Pumpkin Porter, right up your alley, John. Uh, barrel aged from I, Epic <laughs> Brewing, eight point seven percent. I know. I asked him when that was, when how old that thing is. Yeah, th that's something you would have had at the tap house. I know. I think <laughs> I Epic. did have that yeah. keg in my tap house. <laughs> Epic Brewing. That's... It was like a year long. It didn't. It just, I had it for so long. I was like, ah, I'll just keep it for next Halloween. It's <laughs> aged now. Yep. GI says he's got everything on hand to uh, clone my drink. Uh, kid holding cup, awkwardly looking. <laughs> uh, you should go for it. it. It's a good cocktail. Uh, uh, Skull says, now I want a Bloody Mary. You know, I said Bloody Mary, and I'm not a huge Bloody Mary fan, but... I kind of want a Bloody Mary now, too. Like, like once I said it, it's like, oh, I could use some onion rings. I am. Oh, yeah. I'll like, <laughs> I am just not a fan of Bloody Marys. I just everyone makes theirs all different, but it just ends up tasting like either 
straight tomato juice or pizza sauce. Right. Uh, I, I I can appreciate a good spicy Bloody Mary. You get a lot of pepper back in it. You, you, you know, and, and with some good garnishes and whatnot. Like, it, I could enjoy a Bloody Mary. It's probably not a go-to, um, even in the mornings. Uh, you know, like you know hangover cure in vegas like I, I i did a bloody mary one time and oh that was a mistake uh, oh yeah <laughs> but uh yeah they, they no my office made uh because we like shut down halfway through christmas or like two days before christmas and they're like oh we're making bloody marys i was like uh just give me the vodka mm -hmm. i just want the i just want the vodka mm -hmm. <laughs> i'll be more happy with just that yep 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 all right Let's go ahead and dive into some news, starting yes. with from BBC. Uh, TikTok is set to uh, release a 60 minute daily screen time limit for any user under the age of 18. Uh, this is coming what I feel is in advance of uh, some litigation to happen, uh, some laws to start hitting the books on tech companies and their advertiser relationships with children. Uh, because TikTok does serve up ads and they are using analytics and driving uh, engagement with, with users. Specifically, uh, one of the biggest used apps around the world right now be uh, between the ages of 14 and 24 is TikTok. And it really doesn't yep. matter what country you live in, that's where you're at. Uh, I will say I can confirm this with some of my younger friends. Uh, they are absolutely into TikTok. Um, I I have an account. I've scrolled a couple of times. I've I've thus far avoided like devoting huge amounts of my time to it. But I will say, um, I found myself in the last couple of months watching a lot more YouTube Shorts. Uh, you know, in between you know checking email and some other things. Like I'll, I'll yeah. let Shorts run for you know fifteen minutes or so and. I do that a lot. Um, so I, I definitely get it. Now, there's a lot of criticism specifically over TikTok around its Chinese roots. I can't say that I'm any more upset with TikTok than I am with Google or Microsoft or any of our other, you know, massive tech overlords, Apple, uh, for... Yeah you know, data mining and data harvesting off of miners uh, for the purpose of advertising. Uh, you know, it's no secret that Apple got into classrooms uh, in the late 90s, specifically so they could basically breed a generation of people who only ever used Macintoshes in, in schools and would grow up to become you know, professionals or college going folk, and they would go and buy Apple computers because that's what they knew. And uh, those people went on to buy MacBooks in, uh, in you know, 2006. When they got older. Yeah. When they got older, and it absolutely did work. I mean, what's one of the number one laptops on college campuses? It's MacBooks, it's Apple. Apple owns like 60% of the market for college campuses. It's insane. Um, and a lot of that, stemmed from their investment into classrooms in the mid to late 90s. Um, so there is the the battle of of getting eyes onto your platform uh, to make it intriguing to to continue to be successful. Um, there's also the money to be made now off of advertising. Now obviously the internet was brand new in in the mid 90s and so there there was no advertising revenue online. You know, that really didn't happen until 2000 and then moving forward. But uh, it, it, it's still one mind share, you could say, from that investment. And and there have been numerous yeah. tech companies that have done similar practices over the years. Uh, Google is the most recent one that comes to mind with uh, uh, the state of Oregon has an agreement with Google that Google will provide G Suite or Google Apps or whatever they call it these days for free to all educational institutions in the state of Oregon. Um, uh, other states still have to pay. It's still a, a, a paid for service, but basically every school system in the state of Oregon now uses Google for the base of their infrastructure. Uh, 
which means kids are doing homework in Google Docs. Kids are submitting homework over Gmail yeah. and and through Google Classroom. And uh, absolutely, buy, buy Microsoft rights. Office, right. basically. Right, right. Buy Microsoft Office. I don't need to know how to use Word. All I need to know how, is how to type a paper and be able to to submit it electronically. Uh, yep. Welcome to the new age. And oh, by the way. Once you graduate, you can migrate your school account into a standard Google account, changing your email and your address and, and everything else and having it follow you for the rest of your life. And how best to win over someone into an environment and an ecosystem than basically forcing them into it in kindergarten. Uh, that's the way of the new future. And so this is not a new thing uh, of, of targeting youth to encourage future profits. Uh, what is a new thing is data mining youth and delivering advertisements. Um, so TikTok is definitely under the ire of a lot of different uh, governments around the world, partially because it's a Chinese-based company, but also partially because they are targeting youth for profit. Uh, uh, well, I think I think all social media in general is also targeting youth to especially right now. I mean, YouTube shorts, like you said, are very interesting. And that's the mm -hmm. same thing. Instagram. Uh, I mean, th these people, these companies, like you were saying, the media, they're not going after the 35 plus year olds that are parents. They're no. going after, you know, their kids or their younger brothers and siblings. They're looking for the middle school you know junior hires to high schoolers to freshman college kids yep that's who they're looking for all of them are and it's not just tiktok like you said right so. yeah tiktok isn't targeting me but it is targeting uh people that i watch people that that uh, that i enjoy watching uh there's uh gosh i'm drawing a blank on her name now um the uh security officer from strange new worlds she's constantly on tiktok and posting things and and doing the the dance coordination and, and stuff like that and it mm -hmm. it's a fun watch every once in a while you know yeah. uh and, but it, it's that age of people good lord i'm older than star trek actors now uh it's that age of people i know <laughs> <laughs> uh that are really being drawn into the platform and uh yeah uh, uh, according to, gosh, who was this, uh, Imran Ahmed, uh, who's the chief, chief executive of the Center for, for Countering Digital Hate, which is a, a UK-based organization, um, he is basically equating TikTok's algorithm with crack, with little dopamine drips, uh, yep. and it's, it's one of the most addictive algorithms that that they've come across as far as keeping people engaged with content. But it's also one of the most harmful as they found that within a couple of minutes of creating an account and then starting to like or skip or enjoy videos, 13 year old girls are receiving eating disorder and self harm content in their feed because that's yep. what other girls have been watching and upvoting or whatever else. And it automatically just, pinpoints you as a person and goes, hey, you, uh, <laughs> here's content that uh, we that found other 13 year olds. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, that's the thing. It's not it's it's saying it's building upon your content that you like, but it's also technically building on, OK, you're 13, your girl, you're in this area on similar demographic, demographics to you. Right. Some, you know, yeah. And so it's like, OK, well, we're going to take two percent of what you like. And then throw it into 98% of what that other demographic is liking now, too, or looking at. So we're going to feed you a bunch of that stuff. Right. A and so that's what's hard. It's it's I find myself e even now. So I'll use TikTok, but then I find myself more of uh, this like uh, hacks. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like tool hacks or, or craftsmanship. I like a lot of that stuff, like the woodworking stuff. Like, oh, that's really cool looking. I'll find myself watching those reels. Right. Um, and it's like, no matter how many of those I like, then the 10th one is like, yeah, it's, it's some dance video or, or, or yeah. some stupid, uh, you know, Jake Paul wannabe person. Yeah. And it's like, 
I never liked any of this. Right. You know, uh, so I don't know why it's feeding it to me. Uh, so, but so they're still, they're still pushing even though to me, but then it's like, how much, well, are they pushing even harder to kids? And that's the problem mm-hmm. is kid, little kids are like, Oh, that was funny. And they'll like it. And then it's one time and they just keep liking things and liking things. And it's like, honestly, I rarely ever will even hit like, right on those videos because like i don't even want it to know i'm watching it <laughs> i don't want this in my browser history i don't want this yeah it's like, yeah, scroll it's like all right yeah uh, vpn into australia okay <laughs> i'm gonna use duck duck go okay here we go yeah i'm good uh john daylights is a 19 year old australian girl so <laughs> daylights moonlights excuse me uh in september 2021 well it's daylights because it's australia oh yeah okay yeah yeah no you're you're yeah, right it works yeah, yeah it works. I, that's exactly the joke i was going for uh <laughs> in september 2021 tiktok said it had more than 1 billion active users uh active monthly users making it one of the largest social media sites in the world uh it doesn't release demographic breakdowns of its users but uh and this is directly quoting bbc by the way uh, but is viewed by social media marketers and advertisers as being one of the key platforms to reach people under the age of 34. So mm. there you go. Uh, the 60 minute limits will be an opt out feature. And so it will be automatically, uh, added to your account if you are under the age of 13 it will have it will be an opt out feature to not have the screen timer on but anyone under the age of thir- of uh, of 18 uh will still receive uh weekly screen time uh reports in in their email uh letting them know how much time they spent on TikTok uh, i'm not sure if that's going to be uh cc'd to parental units of any kind or uh you know accessible by parents in any way shape or form but the data is going to start to be there uh to see actually how much time is spent by 13 to 18 year olds on tiktok it's a lot (laughs) it's a lot no i i i I, there's a reason why instagram and youtube started making shorts and and pushing reels and stuff Mm -hmm. is is they're wanting this also this type of algorithm this dopamine hit this yep thing it it, it is contagious i mean really this is actually probably for our age the new like bathroom thing instead of a game oh i'm on the i'm in the bathroom i'll watch like two or three instagram reels or tiktoks or something like that you know i have a break i'm gonna watch it I don't know. It's just uh, so much. I, I kind of migrated from Reddit back onto Twitter. Like I like I was on mm. Twitter years and years and years and years and years ago. Um as, as kind of like a direct access platform where hey cool, like celebrities, they're just like me and and whatnot. And, yeah. and you know, they're dealing with you know whatever daily problems they have or hey, that's really cool. I I get to see you know such and such hanging out with with this other person. Oh, that's that's a lot of fun. And then from like 2013 through 18 or so, I was always on Reddit. And then right around 2018, I kind of migrated back to Twitter. And yeah, now you know how I spend my bathroom breaks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> At least over the last yeah, but decade. That's, uh, well, that, but that's what that's what the new TikTok is going to be. So mm-hmm. it's like it's it's the new bathroom breaks. It's like, oh, let me watch this and let me watch that. And it's, uh, it, it's hard. I mean, yep uh this it's it's but you know what's funny is 10 15 years ago we would be like oh this will never happen to me and i won't get sucked into this and that (laughs) jeff and i were you and i were the old guys yeah you know okay boomer (laughs) uh or or is it zoomer but with an x right (laughs) oh there you go we are are we zoomers now because of zoom is that a thing? Ooh. We are the age. I mean, I mean, we're on Zoom right now. You... I know, and so we're the age of that. And then I'm betting how many people even use Zoom anymore now. This uh, is so outdated. It's still a massive platform. It 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 is I know. still a. Well, so is Facebook. <laughs> but we're not talking about Facebook here. We're talking right. about TikTok. So 
you know, where, why are we not on TikTok live? As, as someone honestly. who had to spin up a dozen organizations onto Zoom <laughs> uh, in 2020, let me tell you, it's a lot of people who use Zoom. Uh, so, ah, uh, cool. Yeah, TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. In all honesty, just stay away from it. <laughs> Yeah, if you're my age, you don't have time. Just trust me. Yeah, <laughs> just just and if you're gonna do it, make sure to subscribe to Hops and Brews. Right, right. <laughs> you know, like self plug. I, I I like the the analogy to it's the crack cocaine of algorithms, but I will also say that when I was a kid, cocaine bear was a completely different threat than it is today. <laughs> Uh, that was a completely different animal, so to speak. Uh, today's episode of Talking Heads is brought to you by Linode. <laughs> I was going to say, speaking of addictive, <laughs> Linode. Linode, if you've ever needed to host your own servers, it also means you get to host all your own problems. And even the most skilled network engineer will tell you, you should decentralize your network. So why not host your services with Linode? If it runs on Linux, it'll run on Linode. That includes software from most of the tutorials you'll find on my channel, like how to run your own ad blocking, recursive DNS servers, VPN gateways, your own cloud-based Plex servers, and more. They offer shared CPUs for as little as $5 per month, and can scale as high as you need to go. Whether it be virtualized hosting, dedicated enterprise GPUs, NVMe block storage, and more. Even if you do host your own servers, you can use Linode to give a backup off-site. Because remember, RAID is not a backup. Linode is also expanding at light speed, with 12 new global data centers planned before the end of 2023. Visit linode.com slash craftcomputing and get a $100 60-day credit just for signing up for a new account. That's linode.com slash craftcomputing. And again, a huge thanks to Linode for continuing to sponsor Talking Heads. Speaking of, someone brought this up in the chat, and I'm going to sit there and say this. Congratulations. Jeff is almost at the 300K. So if you haven't already, like and subscribe to this channel. Uh, hit the like button on this this video and all the other ones. So check that out. Make sure you do that. Um, Let's I've, go I've over earned, 300. Yeah, I, I've earned like... 500 subs in the last two days like like i thought i was another three four weeks out or so from the 300k mark all of a sudden i went from 298.8 to uh i think right now i'm at 299 355 or something like that like yeah. like i gained like 600 ish subs in in the course of like a week uh so yeah we are going to be super close to that uh sometime this week, maybe yeah. next, uh, I will be crossing that 300k mark. Uh, you know, I, I've got the plaque, but I, I want my other two plaques, damn it. <laughs> I want two more <laughs> silver play buttons to put on my wall. <laughs> what is it, 500 or what is it? Uh, no, it's a million is your next one. It's a mil at, at a million, you get a gold. One. At 10 million, you get a diamond. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. I'll get I'll get the first one in in ten years. You'll get there. You'll get there. <laughs> I'll get there. I'm I'm trying I, I to think... bring my coattails along for you, but no one's grabbing on. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. I'm gonna start doing server build. I'm gonna do the, you're gonna do the Chinese. I'm gonna do the Japanese motherboards. I'm gonna find some weird some weirder <laughs> thing than AliExpress. Right. I'm gonna do North Korean motherboards. <laughs> uh, those those are Commodores. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they're classics. They are e Technics has built his whole channel on that. <laughs> Andy, I hope you're doing well. I saw you got your channel back. I hope you're doing well. It's not a low show. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, Andy. Love your channel. Keep, keep the gloves up, John. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> My, I'm, I'm like I'm like punching down here, and I'm maybe hitting the bottom of his toe. All right. right. <laughs> my channel a uh, special video for 300k you know i i've never really done anything for any of my other benchmarks like part of me is like super excited like there's a part of me that wants to like you know shoot off confetti and streamers and and you know let's get drunk like woo! there's woo! another there's another part of me that that understands and this has really come as i'm getting older and older of like it's another day like, 
it, it's a good milestone. You know, 40 is going to be a good milestone, but I'm going to wake up the morning of being 40 and uh, be like, he is a lot like 39, but with a slightly more sore back. Like, like that's that's kind of my... It's not that I don't appreciate the 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 high water marks when I hit them. I absolutely do. I live in the moment. Uh, every time I get a, a one out of 10 video on YouTube, ah, I relish that. I love it. Uh, by the way, my last two videos, both ones of 10s. Like, uh, yeah. So, so it's not like I don't understand the the gradios of of the moment or the number of subscribers I have. Let's put it this way. I grew up in the Eugene Springfield metro area um, of Oregon. I have more subscribers than that entire metro area. Like, like at this point, I'm shooting for Portland at like 1.2 yeah. million. Like I have more subscribers than I know of people that existed in my lifetime in that region. And, and that's nuts. And, and I get that. Like, um, gosh, I remember when I hit 60,000 subscribers and I, I went to a, uh, uh, a football game. I went, I went to a, a duck game in Austin stadium and I went, I have more subscribers than can fill this stadium. And that's a weird feeling. That's a really, yeah. really weird feeling of like, you're known by this many people by name online. And, and yeah. now I'm five times that number. And that's a weird feeling. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's so weird too. Like you'll go to a convention now or something. And then it, it's still weird to be like, Oh, your craft computer. Like, I have no idea who you are, but it's like, dude, thank you for you, the, no matter how I think, no matter how high you are, there's still that, that, that gratefulness you feel of, of someone that you've never like, Oh, I love your channel or something like that. Right. You know, e e even I, like I said, uh, the trap door guy, it was like, oh, I know you from this. Like, that feels good. But you know why? It's because the effort you put and the passion you put into the channel. If you didn't care about your channel, you wouldn't feel that way. Yeah. And right. because, you know, people that do like you and I, uh, whether it doesn't matter the number of subscribers, it's when someone random, it's like, oh, that's that's a great little validation, mm -hmm. you know, type of a thing. Right. Um. So. um yeah. I, I, you know, the last couple of events that I've been at, I, I've started to be like, a, hey, you're you're Jeff, you're you know, and, and and whatnot. And even in the the market of the Linuses and the Jays and the Kyles and Pauls and whatnot, you know, it it's still it's it's still kind of shocking to be recognized. I've been recognized in public quite a few times, uh, and uh, and it's always a little bit a little bit shocking. I'm always a little like. Wow. Okay. Like yeah. news travels fast kind of thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's very, it's a very weird feeling to have a public facing image that, that people resonate with and, and, and appreciate from you. Like, cause I'm just a guy, I'm just a guy. I, I still picture myself as just a guy who tinkers with weird crap in my basement. Only 300,000 yeah, people have a can watch me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a guy in my basement. I turned the camera on. Yeah. Right. I tinker with stuff. I quit a six figure <laughs> job to turn a camera on and make YouTube videos. Like, yeah. Do you all understand that? <laughs> Yeah, like like I could have just kept working, and you, I would yeah, have been I mean you could have completely happy. You could have done that, and then slowly got up to like a hundred thousand subs, and then just every now and then got got some decent decent extra income out of it, and been like, oh, I'm perfectly happy. Um, now. my last week of work was the week that I hit a hundred and twenty five thousand. Yep. Um, or okay, so sixty thousand or whatever. Right, right. Um, but uh. Yeah, it was it was it was quite the decision, and and the channel was not ready for that decision. By the way, uh, kind of like getting married early. I don't recommend it for everyone. <laughs> um, but you know, I've I now sustain not only myself but a a full time employee, video editor, you know, uh, yep. business manager, kind of position with Rhett, and like. Years ago, if you said, 
you're going to be able to pay your mortgage every single month and take care of your family and make car payments and your family is going to be more financially secure than they ever have been. Oh, and you're also going to pay for someone else's mortgage and family security. Out of bullshit. Like, like there's yeah, no yeah. way. I, I, don't you dare put that on me, Ricky Bobby. Right, right. I don't need that kind of pressure. But here's where we're at. Like, um, and and I did re reverify that I was paying Rhett a a solid living wage, and I absolutely am. Um, but it's <laughs> like, hang on, let me read there this. Yeah, let me run All the numbers. Right. Okay, okay, you're well above the bell curve. Okay, cool. Um. <laughs> You can afford two McDonald's cheeseburgers. Okay. Right. You're good. And all the <laughs> rainier you can drink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, DTW. What's a DTW? Any chance you were at DTW to 2019? Um, I no. was in DFW in 2019. Dallas, Fort Worth. I was at QuakeCon uh, in 2019. Um, Detroit. <laughs> Yeah, nice prices. Shout out to Rhett. He's killing it. He absolutely is. Um, New technology at Detroit. I don't know. So, yeah, I don't know. Don't know. Is. Huh. Rhett gets overpaid. Check. Yeah, probably. <laughs> 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 but once you once you make an offer, you can't rescind it. <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 I'll take that deal. It's like, ah, oh, crap. Um, like, ah. I could have done with one Rainier a day. Yeah. yeah, one of Rhett's main jobs around here anymore is to make sure that all of my ad slots are filled. Uh, because that's one of the main things I don't have time for, is is in between writing content and then also being a dad to three kids, being a stay-at-home dad for three kids, is uh, <laughs> it's really hard to keep up on communication for business related matters and making sure I have someone who can just go, Hey Jeff, I need an answer on this. And I go, Oh yeah. A. And he goes, okay, cool. And he'll write up the email and he'll send it out. And he makes sure all those things happen, which by the way, Holy crap. We have an amazing ad coming out this month. I, like oh, I, I saw the last one. That was really good. Oh no, 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 no. Uh, Th This one's good. This one's better. This one's good. Is it as it is as good as the time traveling or the the hippie wig one? <laughs> um, I think this is going to be on par with that. Um, maybe not quite encroaching onto Manscaped levels because it's all family appropriate, but at the same okay. time, it's it's interwoven so tightly with some humor. It's just so good. Like I like I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait for you all to see today's sponsor. Right. <laughs> like there would have been a good segue. That would have been a good segue. Mm -hmm. Speaking of segues, there's something to do with cars. Yes. Uh, did we have a couple super chats to hit? Yeah. Uh, Graham sends yeah. over five uh, euro dollars, five five uh, five pounds sterling. Uh, thank you so much, Graham. I helped build a cocktail bar in a community center once. Then we tested the full menu. Uh, John, you know what that's like. Uh, I do. I have not had a cocktail <laughs> since then. Only beer or straight whiskey now. Um, yeah, it's it's really funny uh, what makes you stop drinking. And sometimes it's just the simple fact of drinking too much. Uh, that was with me with tequila. Right. Uh, I, I don't like tequila, but I've never had a bad experience with tequila. Um, I have had bad experiences with vodka. Uh, I still like vodka, but it's definitely not my go-to. Uh I've also had some terrible experiences with whiskey and gin. And I still go to it. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it terrible experience or is it just bad decisions? Mm -hmm. That's hmm. the thing. Bad decisions is not the whiskey's fault. That's the user's fault. There's one particular instance I blame you for, but <laughs> but we won't go into that here or there. <laughs> you know which one I'm talking about, too. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> you, you did that. <laughs> that was a good night. That was a good night. Uh, Ryan also sends over $2. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, guys. Long time no see. Happy 300K-ish. Ryan, I do remember your name. Thank you for, uh, for joining in or uh, coming back or getting time off work or staying up late or whatever it happens to be. But thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, 
Let's see. There was... NetGuy says, you need some AliExpress affiliate money. You killed all of their 10900H stock. Um, yes, I did. Um, <laughs> man, did you know AliExpress pays upwards of 7% for affiliate links? No. Do you want to know how many motherboards I sold <laughs> from the last video? <laughs> Well, for one with that 300k people, yeah, yeah, probably. Jeez, you're like, I don't. This video is sponsored to you by AliExpress now, and they don't even know it. Right. Um, not that it clouds my judgment at all. A bad product is still a bad product, but uh, oh man, um, John, I'm gonna I'm gonna DM you the number real quick. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will not share it. That is for the last 72 hours. <laughs> That's 72 hours of affiliate links on AliExpress for one motherboard. All right. So AliExpress sells beer equipment, right? <laughs> they probably do. AliExpress. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, a bad product is still a bad product, and I'm always going to review things as such. But, man, I I might dig even further into a lot of AliExpress stuff. Not like I didn't already, but uh, I, I did yeah, get on got... and ordered uh, four new products to review this month, this next month. Uh, so keep an eye out for those, what will likely be four different videos. Um, what is that thing? <laughs> All right, hang on. I'm gonna send this to you. It's like, oh no. What, what do you think? What do you think this is? It's like you hook it to your bottle, and it's a draft system, but it's the most okay. awkward draft okay, system here, here, from a bottle. Here's what we're looking at. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden, John's looking for for AliExpress stuff to get to get that affiliate money, yo. Uh, so it is a beer top. It's a glass top bottle dispenser. Yeah, but what? How is it pressurized? Yeah, I don't. I don't get this. What's the point? Does of this, this have to be hooked up to house air? Like okay, okay. There, there's a line underneath the draft. Yeah. Okay. So your your fitting there goes down into house air so house is... co2 oh no wait it's a filler uh no Glass... there's, a, there's a nipple on it john oh okay there's oh, uh okay. if you look at the image right now there there's two yeah there's two air nipples okay on it. i don't beer I don't... tap filling tool yeah interesting interesting that's interesting yeah so they do have some beer stuff. Well, maybe, I mean, maybe there you there's a new market for you. Like there it is. They have a lot of distilling stuff. But... Set set up your homebrew setup from AliExpress. I know. Yeah. How much? Also, how you much said is distilling to... stuff. Oh, sorry. They did. Sorry, there's for, a... for essential oils. I mean, oils. water. Oh, sure. it's, it's it's essential oils. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Essential oil makers. Mm -hmm. Anyway. We should probably get on to the second story, seeing as how it's 654, and I need to make another cocktail in, oh, about six minutes or so. Uh, I know. Ford has patented technology for future self-driving cars, in which if you miss your payments, it will repossess itself. Hashtag a boring dystopia. Um... Yeah, no, that's that's a real technology that Ford has introduced a patent for. Um, they've also got a funny one where if you are behind on payments, your car will start making annoying sounds while you're driving it. Okay, so when I when I saw this, all I thought was, sure, they'll do this, and then all, and then Ford will start relying on this. All that's going to happen is then someone's going to hack this and people will start getting free cars. <laughs> Why are all the Fords like, driving to one location in downtown Albuquerque? <laughs> like... Or or someone's going to hack it to where like, here, here's the code to break it. And it actually goes to their house and they keep it or something. Right. You know, 
It's like, oh, whoops, what happened there? Uh, so the patent was filed back in 2021, but it was granted last week. Um, and the system would apparently kick in if the car owner failed to respond to messages informing them they were falling behind on payments. At that point, a series of measures would first be used to make the car unpleasant to drive, then impossible. Finally, as a last resort, the car would return itself to the showroom. Uh, the system could begin by disabling features such as GPS, music, or air conditioning. <laughs> Oh man. If if you were pissed off over heated seat subscriptions, I can't imagine signing the waiver to allow Ford to do this. Because what? here's the deal. When you purchase a vehicle, um and you finance said vehicle, what you are doing is taking ownership of a vehicle but with a lien against it. Which means yep. if you don't fulfill your end of the agreement, a la paying off the vehicle, the lien holder can then come back at you and repossess said asset. This works for houses, this works for cars, this works for a lot of financial things. If you've ever gotten a personal loan, you might've had to put something up for collateral and said like, yeah, I'll sign away my you know, 1792 Stradivarius violin if I fail to pay back this loan. And if you fail to pay it back, guess what? The bank's gonna come take that violin. Um, so the car is the collateral. Um, but you are the owner of that car, even if there is a lien against it. And this works with your house as well. You're a homeowner, even if there's a lien against your home. Um, so it's really interesting that anyone in their right mind, and, and I know this is going to sound like anti, like, oh, fortune, just let the people keep it. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is whoever in their right mind would sign up for a program that would allow Ford to drive the vehicle <laughs> back to their showroom. Like, well, if, like if uh, Ford's my... had a bad month, they can flick the switch after like, I don't know, 24 hours of mispayment. <laughs> like... Yeah, right. Well, my, I was then thinking, OK, what happens if it's OK in a crowded area, someone so, and someone or it, it gets into an accident? What happens if that system fails and injures someone? Right. Who, Are who's you liable? liable? For, you're technically who's liable? still the owner. Although once yeah. Ford activates the phone no, the home, repossessor, the repossessor owns it. Right. So it would be Ford. Right. Um, also, what happens if you're like, say, you went and and got it on sale in, uh, and then you move to a rural area, the gas can run, you know, is empty and just pitters out in the middle of the road. What happened in the on the road? Yeah. What happens then? You know, I doubt every Ford dealership is going to have this GPS locator. Uh, you know, in every one of their dealerships, you yeah. know, before this initiative goes out. So this is, uh, I don't know, dumb, 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 really bad on Ford. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, this is a weird, like I said, a boring dystopia type patent, uh, but they have been granted that patent. This is now Ford patented technology of, uh, if you fall behind on your payments, we will just have the car drive itself back to us. I don't know how I feel about that, <laughs> to be honest. Well, if it, if it is patented, that doesn't mean they're going to use it. They just wanted it patented right. for they, that they wanted option. to Right. So, so that, that could, that, I mean, don't know, because a lot of companies do do stuff like that, saying, you know, mm -hmm. we want a patent on... X that way our competition can't claim their cars do this. Right. And this patent might also fall into a particular category of driving back to a particular location. Right. That actually could be the patent. It's not for repossession, but just a GPS then can be driven to a pre a particular location. And then Ford could say, well, we get 30 cents for every car or, or hundred dollars for every car that has this feature because we have a patent on that. That actually could be the patent. So yeah, I because we haven't looked at the physical patent itself, but maybe yeah. that's what Ford's thinking. Right. I don't know. Uh, so at the bottom of the article, 
Uh, Ford did not respond to request for comment by NewScientist.com, uh, but they did get in touch with a security expert from the University of Surrey, UK, Alan Woodward, who said there are definitely security risks with such a system, saying, quote, it'll be a brave vehicle manufacturer that builds this into their vehicle <laughs> as standard. I can imagine a car thief not, find, not just finding an unauthorized way into the system, but also social engineering authorized users to give them access, end quote. And yeah, that was one of my first thoughts is any, yeah. any potential, any system is a vulnerable system. Uh, look no further than Stuxnet, which was an air gapped nuclear reactor and got infected with a virus by the U S government from like 1999. Like yeah. th this wasn't anything else this was literally a virus that will hop onto a floppy drive and lay inert until it finds the exact protocols and and listening ports that it's looking for and then it will become active um so any system that exists can potentially be exploited and man one that automatically drives your car away i don't know about that well yeah yeah i mean just even the systems that are nowadays that we kind of take for granted, like the, the wireless keyless start, mm -hmm. you know, there's even the whole distancing that they had to work out for a long time. Yeah. Of, of, you know, you could be in your diner on the window seat and, you know, as long if your car was, I think it's like 50, 60 feet, someone could just hop in mm -hmm. and be like, Oh, I know this is automatic start. Let's, let's see if it's unlocked and let's see if I could do this All right? and take off with your car. Yep. You know? So, yeah. Uh, there was at one point in time mythbusters were looking into rfid nfc as as it relates to car security and credit card security and what would it take for someone to steal those credentials uh they had submitted the script a, a draft of the plan to discovery for approval and uh i guess like 48 hours later Adam and Jamie, who were the executive producers of Mythbusters, were called down to the Discovery offices. And in the room was every lawyer for every credit card company on the planet saying, you will not produce this episode. Yeah. You will not expose how fragile how easy. Yeah. NFC, RFID technologies are. Security researchers know. But there's security researchers knowing, and then there's literally everyone else knowing. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was, what, one of the number one shows at a given time? Oh, yeah. On a, you know. Yeah, it was one of the uh, number one cable shows ever. Uh, yeah. You know, millions upon millions of eyeballs every single week. And, uh, but no, they, uh, they, they got sat down in front of legal counsel for... Discover, American Express, Visa, MasterCard, uh, uh, Chase, Wells Fargo. Who like probably every owns major stock creditor, in Discovery. <laughs> yeah. Every single major creditor or credit authorizer was in that room. And they said, you yeah. will not produce this video. <laughs> Adam Savage has a much better story about it because, well, he was in that room. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, John, are you taking second helpings of your dinner tonight? I, I am. I am taking second helpings. Uh, I'm, it's a little bit lighter on the ounce count, but not the ABV. Uh, I got a brand new pack. If anyone, again, followed me on TikTok, they'd know. <laughs> uh, but Pelican Brewing, a local brewery here, uh, released what's called their double pack. And the reason I wanted this is because they also have a double Pilsner and what I'll be having today, which is a double red ale. Now, a double uh, a red ale in general in the Pacific Northwest is very rare, and so when you get a double version of it, you jump on it. And I do love a good red ale. Even one of my favorite beers is a red IPA. So let's check what this is. And I just spilt it onto my jeans. There goes 10 calories that I needed. But it is a beautiful-looking beer. Oh, man. Oh, I can see I'm, right. I'm, I, can, I'm, I can see the lens. I'm, I'm gonna go up Paris Hilton on you and go. That's hot. Oh, oh, that smells of malt. Oh, after March, Jeff, you'll probably need to get get some of this. Get one of those. 
I I will. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You're you're it, think Imperial Dawn of the Red. Oh. It's wow. in, it's Imperial Dawn of the Red. Wow. That mm. sounds amazing. Um. Oh, it's so good. Oh, I'm gonna do. I might even have to do a review on this. I. It's. it's I am gonna piss some people off right now. Because that's the fun. Well, you already screwed up an old fashioned. So I already screwed up an old fashioned. Now I'm going to ruin scotch. Oh, take the smoke out of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. Well, John, what is my favorite drink? Well, that's an old fashioned. An old fashioned, right? Um. Yeah. What is my favorite drink at an open bar? Oh, oh gosh, what is it? I forgot what it's called. Um. Oh, I know this because you always order it. Oh, oh, what is it called? Well, I the, forgot. The, well I there's forgot. the Amaretto one. That's probably where you're going, which is the yeah, Godfather. No, I wasn't thinking the Amaretto one. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, what's uh, the other one? I, cause I, I can't remember the name. Oh, Godfather. No, no, Godfather's the Amaretto one. God, Godfather oh, okay. is 50-50 that, Amaretto and Scotch. Um, that's what I was, okay, right. sorry. That, that's what I was thinking, Godfather. That is Godfather. my... That and an old fashioned are my bartender tests. So if I go into a bar yeah. and I don't know the bar, I will say, hey, make me your old fashioned. And whatever they present me with, if it's drinkable, I'll drink at that bar. If it's uh, a maraschino cherry and and Sprite and an orange wheel. A muddled orange. And, <laughs> and well, not, we're done. Um, no, but if we go to an open bar, uh, one of my favorite things to get is simply a scotch and ginger. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yes. Uh, because they usually have some kind of a scotch. Usually it's like a doer's white label or something like that, but it's typically a half step above the Jim Beam or whatever house whiskey they happen to have. And every single bar worth their salt has ginger ale or ginger beer, usually ginger ale out of a soda gun. Um, yeah. But... It's a drink that's impossible to screw up. And so if I go to a bar and the bartender's super busy, I'll just drop a 20 on the bar and go, give me a scotch and ginger. And then I drink scotch and gingers all night long and they're ready as soon as I get to the bar. Like that that's kind of how I roll at open bars. Um, well, I have about this much left in a particular bottle. And so I'm going to make a scotch and ginger but with a Glenfiddich 14. Um... No, no. <laughs> I totally am. No, I'm gonna piss off. No. Even the non scotland There's only like that's that's. So so there two drinks. So there's two, two ounces. Drinks. Tell you what, I, I will save the remainder and I'll drink that in the after party. Okay. That's a, like that's a good two. That's... So so I'm gonna do the two ounces of of Glenfiddich, and then we've got a ginger beer. We're gonna go straight ginger beer here. Better be a high. Is it like cock and bulls or? It's fever tree. Yeah. Okay. So okay, it, fever tree is good. Very a, high drink. Yeah. Ginger. It's it's a good good spicy. It's a good gin, it's a good ginger. Good spicy. Right. If you want lots of spicy ginger with that, right? The cock and bulls is more like a good soda version. Yeah. No. That this is the the super spicy. I want to. I want to. I want pain. ginger. Right. Yes. Um. And then yeah, just a little. We'll swirl. I've got a lime wheel in there. With the lime in it. Gotta get the lime. That's right. And there you go. Scotch and ginger. Um, this is one of my uh, favorite button. cocktails to get at bars because it's it's bright. It's refreshing. Um, what we don't see is this backup bottle of Glen 14. Actually, this is the same bottle of Glen 14, or uh, of, uh, yeah, Glenfiddich 14 that I opened in my I Quit My Job video. I've had this bottle for... I was going to say, you had it for about a year or oh, and a half. Almost years. three years, John. Really? It was 2020 that I quit. It's 2023 now. Man, this all time was flies Right? I swear I started this channel a year ago. I know. <laughs> but no, no. Uh, I have almost been running this channel longer full time than I did with when I was employed. Ugh. Isn't that... That's weird. Right, <laughs> I know. I was I was looking at memories. Now I think about it, it's like, oh, me owning the tap room mm -hmm. was over it was like close to seven years ago. I was like, what? 2017 is when I started, John. I was like, oh man, right? It was six years ago when I started. Oh man, and you had the tap house yeah. for like a year and a half before that. Yeah, it's just like 
Because you bought it in, uh, what, November 15? October 15? Yeah. Something like that? Yeah. Something like that, yeah. Oh, that makes me feel sad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, my God, that's good. I I love all right, all right. scotch and ginger. So, so, so then, your, that particular scotch is not super smoky. No. But it has more smoke than like a white label, obviously. Um, um, I wouldn't even say more smoke than a white label. This this is a Highland Scotch, not an Isla Scotch. Um, okay, I, Isla okay, Scotch so, is the one that's that's the peat moss, the that's smoke, peaty, the, yeah. everything else. This is a, so a Highland, Highland Scotch. Scotch. Yeah. It's it's a much brighter, thinner uh, flavor profile. Um, but it's this stuff is so smooth. It's so good. But can okay? Let me ask you this then. Uh huh. Can you tell the difference between that and say a white label? That cocktail, that cocktail, not the not the scotch itself. Because now there's so much ginger beer in there. Right. Would you say like because at a bar that's probably going to be a 10 to 15 dollar markup on that particular scotch. Right. If not more. Uh, right. Uh, if I was it worth this it? from a bar, this is a 25 dollar drink. Like. Yeah. So uh, but if you order the other one, 8, 10 maybe. Uh, 12, I I would say even uh okay do you think it's worth the marked up price no no okay. uh four that's, cocktails that's what it's four cocktails um while there are exceptions to this rule for cocktails you want a base spirit that most exemplifies the flavor profile you're after and usually that bottle is 20 to 25 dollars or less um there's no reason if you're making a an amaretto sour or a whiskey sour or or a number of other cocktails, especially the more involved cocktails. Um, there's no reason to put high end liquor in them uh, because you're going to drown out all of the nuance that makes it worth that premium price. Uh, yeah. You know, like I said, at, at my house, for my house whiskey, I settled on Seagram 7 as my cocktail whiskey because it's exactly what I want a an American brown whiskey to be. It it has all the right notes, it has none of the wrong notes, and it mixes with everything perfectly. I will drink yeah. Old Fashions, I will do whiskey sours, I will do uh, Seven and Sevens, I will do, you know all kinds of stuff with that particular spirit. And I won't old fashioned's a little different because old fashioned will still play off the nuance because the drink is still 90% whiskey. It's all basically that. Right. Um, yeah. But once you add like a second ingredient, all the nuance from that higher end spirit is gone. And so, no, there's yeah. no reason to make a, well, a that's why everyone ginger. twinges when you make that particular one. Right. But, you know, if I'm getting down to the last couple of ounces, then why That's not? What infinity bottles are for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you make an infinity bottle of scotch. Well, that's what I should do. I should feed my infinity bottle and then take a swig from the infinity bottle. Because because I've got about an ounce and a half left there. Yeah, it looks like it looks like I was, saying, I was almost two ounces, but close. Yeah. 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 So, so I, I think uh, I'm going to feed the infinity bottle tonight, give it a little swirl and then then take back out. So, I think that sounds like a good plan. All right. Uh, moving right along. The FBI is now recommending using an ad blocker when searching the web. Uh, we have come full circle uh, to malicious advertisements and injections when it comes to web security. Because if you remember back in the day, back in like... 1998 through 2004, um, if you visited the wrong site and an ad popped up and it had malicious code in it, you could get viruses from a website just by visiting that website. Now, web browser security has since been substantially upgraded and the goal of viruses became much less about the allure of being able to infect a PC or trying to to gather data off a PC and 
transitioned into the, well, how can I make money off of taking over a PC? Well, you can't make money off a PC or off a user if the user can no longer use their PC. And so malicious viruses that would destroy your computer almost went away entirely. Uh, now, obviously, we have the rise of, of crypto lockers and things like that uh, with ransomware asking for money in return for returning your PC. Um, but but those are still kind of the outlier when it comes to infections and, and yeah. so forth. Um, the FBI is recommending using an ad blocker now because of malicious advertisements that will take your money without you even knowing about it. Um, it could be a malicious ad that dupes you into buying a product that you thought was Amazon, which is actually Amazon, uh, but looking like a legitimate ad and a, and a placement of something that someone would, would believe is legit. Um, this can also be search results, uh, you know, promoted search results that link to fake websites that make you download a malicious version of a bit of software you're trying to download. It could be uh, forwarding you to a website that looks very similar to the one you're looking for, but will take your money and return no product. Uh, now, some people say, well, my business is way too small to be a target of that. And you might be right. That used to be, be. kind of the, the the theory, you know, too small. Yeah, you're on to... you're on the second page of Google search. Right, right. You know, type of Why thing would there. anyone ever want to spoof my particular website? Well, there's an interesting story here. Um Cory Doctorow posted this on Twitter not long ago. Uh it was actually about a week ago, um, that he tried to order Thai food online. So he searched for the name of the Thai food restaurant, which was Keen Thai. Yep. Uh, and the Google result popped up with this. And that is... KeenThaiLA.com versus KeenThaiBurbank.com. As you can tell by the labeling here, which was done after the fact, the sponsored result is a fake website set up for Keen Thai. What they do is they copied the website well enough and copied their entire menu and set up a payment system to basically intercept traffic from patrons who wanted to order Thai yeah. food online. I they mean, would skim I a mean, percentage off the top, place the order, and then King Thai would actually still deliver the food, but you're getting charged like $15 more. And yeah, so... Yeah, because... I, yeah. Go ahead. I go mean... Ahead. I mean no, well, well, that's the thing is uh, you're probably sitting there as the user or consumer thinking, oh, this is a mom and pop shop. Oh, websites are web domains are cheap. You know, it's OK. Oh, they probably have multiple ones. So for the Google search algorithm and that's right. why there's different addresses, but they're both. And then you click on it and it's both the same looking style like, oh, you know, something like that. It's fine. And then you got your food delivered. And you're always going to click that top one now every time. Right. Because, yeah, you know, uh, honey, it's fine. That if that top one works, too. It's fine. Yeah. Um. So here's the fake site. Welcome to King Thai Eatery. Uh, delicious and authentic Thai food in Burbank, California. Like, it looks legit. It's got a good description on it. It's got what appears to be good Thai food there. The real site looks completely different. But there's no real telling... Which one's real, which one's fake? It's not like yeah. going to, you know, Visa.com or AmericanAirlines.com and going, that's definitely a fake site. Uh, this is like, I'm ordering Thai food from a mom and pop place. Like, I, either of those websites would be fine. I'd order food from either of those. You scroll down a little further. Uh, Corey 
ordered food from the fake site. Uh, he got it ordered to pick up. Uh, and uh, the prices were marked up by 15%. He went to pick up his food. And the owner was aware of the fake site. And upon going to pick up his food, refunded him the $15, or the 15% overage from his order. So they, they even lost even more. They lost 30 or right. They lost 15%. And yeah. Right. Yeah. The owner lost, lost 15% because he, he goes, here's $16 for, for the order that you place. And he goes, well, what's this for? And he goes, it's because you ordered from a fake site. I recognize that fake site. They've been ordering food from us for a long time now, and customers started complaining that we were charging 15% more online. Well, that's not the case. What happens is there's a third party that is set up to spoof our website that will take your money, skim 15% off the top, and then forward us the order information. And we think that's dishonest as hell, and so here's your money back. Oh, and your food, because your order was actually placed. Um... So the owner's getting well, screwed out of 15%. Yeah. Uh, the customer's getting screwed out of 15%. And the scammer's website is making off with 15%. Yeah. Well, uh, that's the thing. I mean, you can even do it even easier. Instead of jacking the prices, do an auto tip, mm -hmm. you know? And then that way you look like you don't tip, but then that company just gets the tip. Right. And no matter what, and that's even harder to find. And this is just, again, one example of what is going on so yep. it's really bad out there you know just because you don't think it's just always going to be amazon or walmart or ebay or whatever Google you're or alley yeah. or whatever else right whatever no, else you are not too small to make a small fortune off of if if you are a business who does any amount of revenue um you are not too small to be taken advantage of or have your customers taken advantage of. Yeah. And that's, well, like, that's, that's kind, kind of, of the brave new world of internet and network security. Well, kind of going back though to selling your data, Google is probably selling data there too. And, and for their, or whoever their domain is, could be selling their data. Like this is how many people visit this website. Oh, it's a very popular local cuisine. For you, it's a mom and pop cuisine that makes you know a, a, a decent six figures a year to mm -hmm. to pay for their house. Now they're getting skimmed 15, 25 percent off the top, you know. Yep. yep. And then that you know you do that to enough small mom and pop shops, that that little person or malicious company, they're making a lot. So it can happen, and it, it can happen to you. Could happen to a bar. Could happen to any place that delivers alcohol or food. You know, any, anywhere. Yeah. anywhere. I, so just... I I order food all the time from small restaurants and organizations around my area. Um, Some of the best. Right. One one of my favorites is uh, uh, Sandy M Brewing. Uh, that yeah. they do home deliveries, and they'll they'll bring you a four pack of beer and some of the best fish and chips I've ever had in my life. And it's like, and it's like within the hour they'll do it. Right. Yeah. It's like 26 bucks, but at the same time, I've got a four pack of Sandy M. Their Pilsner is amazing. Yeah. Freaking pirate stout. Like they've got so many good beers and then amazing fish and chips. Like it's totally worth it. Um, Man, if someone took over their website, I probably wouldn't be the wiser. Yeah, right. <laughs> as long as my food gets to me, like I might stop ordering from them because they're like, wow, I used to get this plate for like 20 bucks. Now it's like 32. I, I'm out. And, like, it's and, just and that's much. the other thing. You might just be, oh, well, cost of uh, cost of doing business in a local spot. Mm -hmm. It just kind of got up. You know, that's the thing. You're going to sit there and think that and you're like, oh, or uh, an auto gratuity setting type right. of a deal. Uh, you know, like, oh, uh, yeah, we probably should pay them. And, you know, they're doing hard work. Okay, yeah, sure. 10, 15%. That's fine. I normally do 20. So, you know what? Let's bump it up to 20. Whatever. Um, yeah. And then it just goes to that other person. And it, it's not that hard, actually. Right. It really isn't. Right. I was I was showing my boss a, a program of like, here, I can hack any code you want me to do. I'll change it right here. And it's off of github yeah you know it's not real and then all i have to do is throw this packet 
into like a torrent site and be like, anyone that downloads this is gets back to me. Here's a free program of, of this licensed program. Right. You know, yeah. Um, it's it's not John. Hard. We took an oath to use our powers only for good. I know, I know. I'm just I'm just <laughs> saying. So doing that, maybe don't download that program. Right. No. Uh, nope. Pay for a le- the legitimate I, license. I I had a fantastic training seminar one time. Uh, I was uh sent to a training with Fluke. So Fluke makes a whole bunch of different um meters and gadgets they're well known by a lot of electronic specialists and or uh sorry uh electricians and whatnot a lot for their like clamp meters and multimeters and things like that but fluke also makes a ton of networking equipment as well um they make uh cable testers and and packet injectors and things like that they have a particular tool called the optiview um and this was gosh 15 years ago almost now uh, that uh, my organization bought a Fluke OptiView. Uh, an OptiView is a tablet-sized device. It's got like a nine-inch screen on it. And when I say tablet size, I mean like it has a nine-inch screen. But the thing is, as chonky as a 1980s laptop. Uh, it's about <laughs> this thick. Um, it has network ports on top for both uh, gigabit fiber and gigabit in. Uh, and I, they even do 10 and, and 100 gig stuff now in there. Um, it is a network traffic analyzer. Uh, and it will go into a network and it will sniff out every single endpoint, every single MAC address that exists on this network. It doesn't care about firewalls. It doesn't care about topology. It doesn't care. If it can sense it, it will give you data on it. Uh, it also is set up with like every single generic admin password and so if your switches haven't been reset uh it'll just go oh i have full admin access i'm just going to read everything off this switch then or you can set it with (laughs) known passwords so if you have an organization and you're like oh it's snmpv3 and we're going to use such and such credentials you can just set that in and it'll go i got it from here and it will tell you more than you ever wanted to know about your network um while we were in that training seminar, so uh, me and my my other network engineer got, got sent to this, um, the instructor stood at the front of the class and, and he goes, in front of you is such, such and such device, and today we're going to learn how to use this, but before we get started, I need all of you to raise your right hand and swear to you to use your new pound powers only for good. And And we're all like, well, I knew this could do a lot, and he goes, if you plug this in at an open terminal... At any bank, at any casino, at any any Fortune 500 company, you will have people in suits dragging you into an elevator never to be seen again within 60 seconds. <laughs> because they have tools to detect crap like this. But crap like this is also extremely powerful. Uh, and <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, my flipper zero must have must have a bad USB tester. Um, yeah, flipper is kind of the new the new thing going around right now for like wireless uh, surfing for for things. Um, yeah, fluke is pricey, but but good. Yeah, no, uh, that OptiView was something else. Like if if you give a network tech an OptiView an OptiView two back in like 2012, oh man. <laughs> They were insanely powerful for network diagnostics, traffic sniffing, packet injection, speed testing. Uh, they would also do uh, uh, fault detection, uh, loop detection, like like anything you could ever want it to do, it would do. Yeah, no, it's a lot of those detection tools, they're scary. Yeah. I mean, e- even the cheap ones. That's the thing is, is you're talking about high end level stuff. Yeah, you could get stuff for like twenty bucks. Yeah, and if you just even plugged it in like into your company's network, being like, "Oh, I'm going to do what was even Ethernet, you know what was even the more amazing." Stuff about the fluke was not necessarily the hardware itself because the hardware itself was basically 
a Windows XP machine with Nmap and and a couple of other tools. Now they were very fast versions of of these tools. Like Nmap, it'll go out yeah. and it'll do that, but it takes a tad of time, as they say. Um, this would do it like instantaneously. Um, like it was scary. Like you could plug it into a government office and you would get. 1500 devices into your your view it would also categorize them based on was it a workstation was it a server was it a switch was it a printer was it this was it that yeah. what's open ports what's like boom instant analysis done um but uh the the packet analyzer that they had that was scary uh, and scary in like the best way possible. Uh, if oh, you've yeah. ever done anything with Wireshark, tried to do like packet analysis yep. and, and oh, yeah. handshake analysis and stuff like that, you know that you've got to define your filters properly and okay, you've got a it's client just... and all of your midpoints and then here's the server we're trying to get data from and here, but you're sorting through thousands of lines. Oh, of... oh my God, it's just constant coming in. And, and so it took so much training to be able to decipher all of that information and go like, well, where is X talking to Y? That's what I need to know. And I'm looking for this particular thing. What their packet analyzer would do is automatically rebuild who is talking to what in the simplest of terms. And, and I mean, like a DHCP handshake could take 30 back and forth interactions between client and server like art broadcast hey who's on this network hey i'm a server and it's like hey i'm a client is there any dhcp here yes i have dhcp well i need a dhcp okay well what dhcp do you need i need your dhcp like that's the whole handshake that happens in fractions of a second but every single one of those is a full packet stream that may be forwarded depending on dhcp forwarding and everything else between multiple devices and and art broadcast and everything else. Um, what this would do is it would go, X device requested DHCP and this device responded and here's the response path. But it would filter all of those, those call and responses into one tab. And so if you wanted to see DHCP requests, you click on that and you can see all of the MAC addresses that had mm. requested DHCP and all of the server responses that it got. Um, and it would correlate one to another. Uh, it would do the same thing for every bit of traffic on the network. That's like it was coding. nuts. Like from a diagnostic standpoint, if you've ever had a problem with uh, time to live failing out well, or, or anything like that, it would tell you exactly why a handshake failed, exactly what... Well, yeah, I'm I'm actually looking at it the opposite way of like I know what it would take to code that. I'm like, damn, that's a mm -hmm. flip ton of code and, and analysis right. and a bunch of uh, uh, criteria to to do all that stuff is like wow. Uh, some someone that's a labor of love and yeah. and I that's a team and uh, yeah. I'm betting that whole team doing that was like this is scary and and this and is, and and it was automatic. There was there yeah. were no presets there were no anything that you had to put in it would just go oh you want to see all of the dhcp traffic between clients and servers here it is and here's this client calling out to this server and the response that it got and you can see the whole stream of 30 packets but then it would condense it into one line and and say like here's the entire handshake process of this client to this server and what the what the actual answer was it would also break down the individual packets into oh, this is a DHCP callback and here's the actual DHCP address the client is being given and here's the DHCP client accepting that address and now communicating via that address and, and everything. And that's just DHCP. Like we're at the very yeah. basics of this. Like you want to see the handshake that happens between Chrome as a client and viewing a YouTube video? Like, holy crap. You want to see Netflix DRM? Oh man. <laughs> like and it it did it did protocols that it didn't even know about automatically. Oh jeez. <laughs> scary scary stuff. Yeah. So, but yeah, that back all around whether you get an ad block or not, just 
just be careful mm -hmm. what you click on. Honestly, I never click on a sponsored ad. No. That's all my rules. Are. Even if it's like Amazon or Walmart or whatever, I'm like, no, 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 scroll down, right. go to the actual site. I don't need to give Google four more cents for me clip for for my CPM for yeah. clicking on the sponsored link. I'm gonna click directly on the search result link. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Jeff, you ever um, forgot a password in your life? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you probably use a uh, password uh, protector and, and, and uh, um, I can tell you the phone numbers of all my childhood friends. <laughs> like... Actually, I, I, yeah, well, knowing you, yeah, you you and your memory. But uh, I'm I'm betting you as I can tell uh, you the specs down to the individual numbers of every PC that I've ever owned. Uh, I'm betting you probably have had your fair share of in your time of people go in your IT time of, I forgot my password. Yes. How, who who hasn't in any form of tech world, anything, anything, number one, oh, I forgot my password. Uh-huh. What would happen if you doing that cost you $220 million? Well, then I'd be a fool. <laughs> well... That is happening to uh, someone in L.A. right now. Yep. Uh, this guy left or forgot. he. Well, so what happens is he forgot his password to his Bitcoin wallet. And he's already tried eight attempts. And he's only got two more left before it's gone forever. So what ended up happening was this, this is guy an A&E e miniseries in the making. Yeah, it really is. And. Basically, what this guy happened was back in like, you know, early 2014, 15, when Bitcoin was worth like four or five bucks, they were like, hey, let's do a competition. So who can make the best video or, or advertisement for us? He particularly won. And I think at the time, the the, the Bitcoin was worth like seven thousand so, dollars. No, it, uh, it, know, it was that, it was still worth like like four or five, six dollars. But. Um, in, in addition to his earnings, I think he earned like 6,000 or 6,500 Bitcoin from that particular contest. Uh, yeah. but he already had like another 500 to his name. So he had around 7,002 Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, something like that. Or a market value as of January, 2021 of $220 million. Yeah. That's, uh, um, so unfortunately... He does not remember the password he used. And the particular wallet that he has is after 10 tries, it's gone. It's locked. His account is locked forever. Yeah. Um, and he is on try number eight. So, so here's the really funny thing is there's actually two layers to this. Okay. Layer number one is Bitcoin. His Bitcoin wallet itself has a password on it. Um, he saved his Bitcoin password onto an iron key. I don't know if you remember what iron keys are. Have you ever uh, heard of an iron no. key? No, I haven't. An heard. iron key was a USB drive, um, slightly larger, but made of like solid steel. And it had a password entering like number pad on the USB drive oh. itself. The, oh, okay. the, the entire drive the, the PCB and housing and everything were sealed in epoxy and then sealed inside of a stainless steel enclosure. There's no reading the memory chip off this USB drive. If it, it It's 256 AES encryption. Um, okay. Now, it's probably like a simple six-digit or eight-digit password that he can't remember. But his Bitcoin password is probably a random generated password inside of that iron key. Uh, so he's got to okay, get that's... through his iron key security, which is probably <sighs> more intense than his Bitcoin wallet security. Oh my gosh. I did not see that part. That's so hilarious. Yeah. yeah that, that's the crux of all this is he was following best practices, but he can't remember the password to his password manager vault to get oh, into his that's iron even, key. That's even better. Oh man oh uh, yeah i threw this up here like last minute it's like mm -hmm. oh this is funny let's let's do this mm -hmm. oh gosh yeah 
Uh, right. He's lost That's the hilarious. password to his iron key, which means he cannot access his 7,002 Bitcoin, which is worth a fortune. He's made several unsuccessful attempts, and that's why he's going to be locked out forever, is the iron key itself has a 10 password fail. Uh, I will nuke the contents of my NAND flash forever. That's one of the selling features of the iron key. I used to have one. And, and that's where I used to keep a lot of passwords, uh, was on an iron key. I am more than familiar with the technology and with the risk reward that comes with them. You will As never you try... give up data to a third party with just a simple 8-bit encryption because after 10 guesses, your data will go up in smoke, quite literally. Uh, has he tried God or admin? God, <laughs> love, sex. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right. I have to go take a a unfortunate byproduct break of, a, of, of an my... all liquid diet. An of all liquid diet. That's all right. I can I can carry us for a couple of minutes here. Um. But yeah, no. Imagine your entire. Imagine winning the lottery, but needing to guess an eight-digit combination uh, in ten tries or less. That's kind of where this guy is at. Uh, so there have been a number of instances of people throwing away hard drives or, or whatnot with, like, their Bitcoin wallets or vaults on them. Uh, so this is not a unique scenario, but it's... Uh, a scenario that has happened all the less. Uh, Skull says, I'm a big fan of Lud Love God Sex Admin. Uh, not maybe in that order, but yeah, you, you've got a point there. Uh, Hello, NSA. Can you give me my last password? Thank you, says Chuck. <laughs> Single point of failure is always a bad idea. Well, it's... He didn't have a terrible idea. And let me tell you, those iron keys were actually quite resilient. Uh, yeah. So I'm not... I'm back. I, I, I'm not necessarily sold on the idea that he shouldn't have used an iron key for a password vault, especially all the way back in 2013 when this occurred. When he came into those Bitcoin and went like, I should probably make sure I have a secure password and then make sure that password is locked into something that only I can view. There there were options for, like, open source password management back then, like KeePass still existed back then, but not on a hardware level. You're still dealing with a software database file, and so going with something like an iron key wasn't a bad move. Uh, it's just you need to make sure you remember that password to get into the iron key. Yep, yep. So, uh... You want to bust through these three really quick? Yeah. Um, this one I'm surprised I have not heard more of before. Um, this was interesting. Yeah. Uh, Jack Daniels is on the end of an enraged community and potentially a, a lawsuit over barrel houses in rural Tennessee that are coding literally everything in black mold. Uh, so the pictures on this story kind of speak for themselves. Yeah. Imagine this growing on every porous surface within two miles of Jack Daniels barrel house. That's what's happening in Tennessee right now. It looks like it looks like soot or or dirt or whatever. It's actually a fungus that thrives in an ethanol-rich environment. Apparently, the barrel houses, which are distilling their own Jack Daniels for consumption outside of Lynchburg, Tennessee. This isn't Lynchburg itself. This is a barrel house um, that exists. Uh, the Angel Share which is the ethanol that's released from the distillation and aging process, um, is not being properly filtered, allegedly, allegedly, uh, by Jack Daniels. 
and uh, is settling within a two mile radius of Jack Daniels barrel houses. Uh, yeah. That ethanol rich environment is causing this black mold, this black fungus to grow literally everywhere. Uh, it's, it's actually a very well known thing called whiskey fungus and uh locals are demand they're not even demanding like reparation or or punitive damages or anything like that they just want jack daniels to finally properly filter the exhaust of their barrel houses and i yeah that's a pretty reasonable response well um, I, I i wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these people probably work there or or it's fun you know that that distillery probably or barrel has helps subsidize that town mm -hmm. uh in in so many ways uh, but yeah you know i wouldn't be surprised what it is is probably when they first first put the barrel house there their filtration system was for x number of barrels well over time we've had to increase by 100 and 200 percent yeah we still have the same filtration system that can't account for that right uh you know, that, that's probably, I wouldn't be surprised. And Jack, no, we have a filtration system, you know, here it is. And right. Jack, Jack quite Daniels, obviously it's not working. Right. Jack Daniels response is, uh, let me scroll down to uh, Jack Daniels spokesperson told insider that the company could not comment on pending litigation, but that Jack Daniels quote complies with all local state and federal regulations regarding the design construction and permitting of our barrel houses, adding, we are dedicated to protecting the environment and the safety and health of our employees and neighbors. The problem here is as a company, even if you're following the letter of the law, if you don't follow the spirit of the law, you may still be liable for outside damages like like wastewater and escaping ethanol that causes mold to grow literally everywhere. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's there's concern that the air surrounding these barrel houses is not even safe to safe to breathe because of of this whiskey fungus uh there are the residents are saying that they have to pressure wash their houses with concentrated bleach mixtures uh three four or five times per year <coughs> um uh, you just scrub it down with the jack daniels right right yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. um michael says the fda needs some teeth that could certainly be the FDA is not really the the uh, authority in this situation. This would be the ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, um, as well as any Tennessee environmental. Uh, <clears throat> right. Th this could also be Tennessee Liquor Commission, or it could be EPA, Environmental. Um, yeah. And and let me tell you, the ATF has some teeth, and let me tell you, the EPA has some teeth too. Um, the FDA, not so much, but the FDA really isn't the, the organization on the hook here for jurisdiction. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a messed up situation. And regardless of if Jack D'Angelo is following the letter of the law, as far as their, well, we have a filtration system. Yeah, exactly. If this is That's growing within two miles of your facility, it's not enough. And you can and should do better. Well, that's the thing. It's probably, I, that's what I think. It, yeah, I agree. Uh, and I, I think probably what it is, is, you know, how old is that filtration system? When was that put into place mm -hmm. to state the regulation of, you know, oh, this filtration system exceeds all the, this amount of barrels. Well, yeah, 40, 50 years ago when it was in place, they thought it would work, but now it actually they find out it doesn't work right. because over time it fails. And that's the that could be the new regulations. But then Jack Daniels, the company is saying we're following the rules of the land. It's right. fine. No, there, there probably should be another study, another test right. uh, to double check this type of thing. But, uh, you know, K K Kill they're Sudo not chimes in this as OSHA also if it's a health concern. Absolutely. And if you want yeah. to talk about an organization that has immediately OSHA, accessible yeah, sure. teeth, it's OSHA. 
Um, so yeah, no. It, if anyone wants to call the Tennessee office for OSHA and just randomly report something and request an inspection of the the facility, you would probably be doing a a, a real good solid for for a lot of Tennessee residents um, who are concerned about not only the plant itself but the surrounding couple of miles. Yep. So, yeah, uh, go do that. It's not saying we're, let's boycott Jack Daniels or anything. It was just like, this should be addressed. This should be fixed. You, you should boycott da Jack Daniels because it's a crap product, not because it's... Hey, I like Gentleman Jack. Gentleman I do Jack. like Gentleman Jack. I, 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 I cannot disagree there. Um, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not gonna go buy regular Jack Daniels. Right. Um, I don't. Ha I don't but... have any old number seven. I, I did for a while. I think I finally emptied it. I did have a bottle of single barrel Jack. Um, I, ha I have a bottle of single barrel Jack too. Okay. I like that. It was, I like... it was okay. For third, it's like I got it for like thirty two, thirty five. I think. See, at, and I was like, at that is... price, I think it's fine. I think when yeah. i bought it it was like 55 and and i oh, i regularly ew, see no. it for like 60 and i'm like at 60 dollars, i can get way better bourbon than this oh yeah no 60 60 dollars, i have to be like blown away right i under i understand there's you know one, once i get into like the high double digits to, to triple digits I, I i need to be blown away yeah but that that 50 45 to 60 dollar range it's like it's hard for me to to budget. Yeah. I would rather go buy two low budget things of that that I've never tried mm -hmm. to hopefully I'll be amazed by it. Yeah, than that one. I, I am one who will experiment in the sixty to hundred dollar range. Like I will I will buy a sixty to hundred dollar bottle maybe once every two to three months. Uh, so if you extrapolate that out, that's like six times a year. Um, I do yeah. have a bottle of Jameson eighteen up on my shelf. I do have, like I said, I've got the Glenfiddich 14 that I'm finally finishing here. I've got a lot of other really nice bottles up there. Um, and uh, I'm not afraid to experiment with like dropping 70 or $80 on a rogue stouted thunder, uh, yeah. you know, and, and, and that kind of thing. And But at the same time, you're right. Like if I'm gonna drop $70 on a bottle, I'm also going to pick up three or four other bottles of things that look or sound interesting that I haven't tried before. Yeah. I mean, like most of my, I would say the $60, I think the most I have here is a $65 bottle. And then everything else is under that because I just, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to justify that one $90 three digit bottle to where I can then theoretically go buy three different lower end stuff that sounds interesting i might need to be disappointed but i got to try three different things instead of one thing that i might have been disappointed in that i just spent a hundred plus dollars on be like yeah this was only worth 45 50 bucks at, at best you know and then i'm gonna have it around for years to be like you guys want to try this you know that's like it's like my blanton's it's like eh <laughs> Yeah. Um. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so Kren sends over another two Aussie bucks. Oh uh, yeah. How much to make a bloody Sheila? Uh, this March. Um, and what's really funny is I'm like, well, I know what a. It's tomato juice and vodka with with pepper. Um, Excellent. and uh, so I went ahead and Googled bloody sheila okay uh there's a couple of drink recipes right up on top uh there's a bloody sheila recipe from delicious.com which kren then linked at. me directly in the discord um and then there's two bloody marys that are also right on top and then there's an urban dictionary for bloody sheila and i went oh what's the urban dictionary say for bloody sheila <laughs> oh, and I gosh, quote, I'm actually posting this to see if anyone can tell me what this means. I overheard it, and judging from the reaction it elicited, I assumed it was from the rusty trombone Cleveland steamer genre. Any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I believe that's exactly what it is. As it turns out, it is a Bloody Mary, but you serve it with a lemon wedge and an olive. 
That's basically already what's in a Bloody Mary. That's that's just a Bloody Mary with an olive yeah. and a lemon wedge. Like, come on, you got to challenge And then a slice me. of pizza and and onion rings. Right, right. So, yeah. Uh, Sid- I'm gonna, uh, Sydney's, I'm gonna... Sydney's bar, the Unicorn, or a Sydney bar called the Unicorn, has crafted a memorable drink with a recipe that incorporates the national treasure Vegemite into the mix. Oh, okay. Oh, Hold Vegemite. On. Okay, okay. Hang only, on. Only the Are method get... doesn't give ah ingredients over the side. Here we go. I see it. Uh, splash of stout. Wow. See, so let me let me copy this recipe over to our tabs so this we can way. actually view it. Uh, delicious.com has this, and we found Australia's best take on the Bloody Mary. Um, yeah, awesome. I had just read the method. Combine ingredients together for Bloody Mary mix. And I went, okay. And then it said, combine Bloody Mary mix with the vodka, lemon juice, and a Collins glass and add ice. And then garnish with an olive piercing and a lemon wedge. I went, well, this is a Bloody Mary. Like, what the hell? Ingredients mix for a Bloody Mary mix. I didn't see this at first. Okay. Ah. Splash of stout. Five grams of rosemary, one gram of bay leaves, five gram of dried chili flakes, which sounds amazing, 40 grams of black peppercorn, 35 grams of crushed garlic, 85 milliliter of red wine, 65 grams of horseradish cream, 125 grams of tomato paste, 15 grams of bonox, five grams of Vegemite, uh, 125 grams of Mary's hot sauce, two liters of tomato juice, and 175 mil of carrot juice. Wait, how big of a how big of a mix is that? That that'd probably get you about sixteen ounces, would be my guess. Yeah. Sixteen to twenty-four ounces for the for the full mix. Um so for the bloody Sheila mix, you're supposed to combine 45 ml of vodka, uh, which is about two and a half ounces, uh, with a hundred ml of the bloody Mary mix and ten ml of lemon juice. But you have to make their Bloody Mary mix. But you use the Bloody Sheila Bloody Mary mix. Yeah. Right. Which is like 24 ingredients. Right. Um, I'm not going to say the, no. Because... It's the Vegemite that scares me. Oh, did you not watch last week's show? I, I went... I watched... Oh, well, I, you were late, so... <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I, I opened the Vegemite. Wasn't terrible. I've I've had some Vegemite from uh, the Australians that we we knew at uh, back in the day. I I can uh, I compared me tasting Vegemite very much to us having the uh, the the Beltier the uh, the Scottish okay. Fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. where you Rhett and Steve were all like, oh my god, that's hot spite. Oh god, I can't get past the burn. And I'm like, oh, a little bit of butterscotch at the back end. That's not bad. <laughs> like, like I appreciated it for what it was. <laughs> so I just edited your parts out to make you look good. <laughs> you're the one who edited that video, and I came out looking very good. Uh, as MVG says, prepare for disappointment. <laughs> You know, inside of that entire mix, it's just going to be a little extra salty. Like I and and I don't really think that's a bad thing in a Bloody Mary mix. So it's it's an interesting it's an interesting mix. It does sound interesting. It's obviously spicy from all the peppers that are going to be in it. Right, so Dried spicy, chili salty. Yeah, right. Uh, Thirty-five grams of crushed garlic. That sounds amazing. Yeah, I'm not saying I wouldn't try it, but I'm not. I wouldn't make it. You know, if you don't have all of those ingredients already, right? That's an expensive drink to go out and buy. It, to that's make an expensive. That's a that's a fifty dollar mixer if you don't have that stuff on hand. It, exactly, and that's so right. And that's buying but, like dirt cheap stuff. You know, if if Kren's gonna go and drop like a hundred bucks, maybe right. Like I said, I'm not saying no. I'm saying it actually sounds pretty good, but I don't know if I'm going to go that far out for a single drink mix that I might only drink once. Because at the end of the day, it's still just a Bloody Mary. And it just happens to have five grams of Vegemite, which I'm going, 
So what are you going to use with the rest of it? Normally yeah. you'd yeah. put salt in a Bloody Mary mix. So you're just replacing that with Vegemite. You're not really breaking new ground here, in my opinion. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, anyways, I'm going to bust through these two really quick. and We can get to the last stuff. Yes. Uh, Athletic Brewing, uh, one of my favorite non-alcoholic breweries, is yeah. coming out with the world's first, world's first free workout brew. Now, this is technically a non-alcoholic brew, but it actually is a pre-workout. And to prove it, I actually got my contact at Athletic, and I will actually be one of the first to review this. Uh, for March. Can you can you shoot them a message on my behalf? Like I'd love to work with Athletic on some releases. I I have uh yeah, I have a contact with their sponsor and I would I could Well, it's funny is some all of the beers that well not all of the beers but a six pack of a separate six pack for you uh -huh. is a reference of all the specialty stuff I got from them. Oh nice. So, uh, it's not the stuff you can get from stores. S and it's it's like a jammy sour. It's a coffee with actual caffeine, uh, but it's all it's a coffee porter with with 10 milligrams of caffeine, but it's non alcoholic. Right. Uh, a mango habanero hazy IPA. That uh, that's sounds not good. It's it smells like the best smelling mango IPA you've ever had. Their light beer is okay. I mean, if you're looking for like a Bud Light, I've I've had uh, a number of their their NA beers. Um, yeah, I've uh, I I actually had one on the show with Steve back in January. He was doing Dry January, so I'm like, you know what? I've yeah. I've got a couple athletic NAs here, and I forget which one that I had, but it was delightful. Well, yeah, no, they sent me a bunch of their like pilot project stuff. Yeah. And it was it was phenomenal. I, I I gave it to a bunch of friends. They loved it. And I saved a six pack for you of the variety. But nice. I reached out to him. So they're sending me this is not this doesn't come out officially till the seventh of this month. And so they're sending me out a pack on the seventh. And then apparently there's also a uh, a post workout that they're going to have. Now the cool thing about this pre workout is it does actually have caffeine in it for that caffeine boost. Uh, it is 0.05% ABV, 130 calories, 23 carbs, 5 grams of protein. So that's where you're getting that pre-workout from. Yeah. And it's going to have caffeine in it. Yeah. So, uh, called um, Speed Up, cool. the new non-alcoholic beer was inspired by the power of positive energy and the grind of endless grit. It's brewed with high-quality coffee and spent brewer's grains. The result is a rich, extra-dark brew that is full-bodied and contains 5 grams of protein. That sounds amazing. Yeah, and and honestly, the, I think the best part about athletic brewing is that it the mouthfeel tastes and feels like craft beer. Yes, it does. Like that's all. That's always been my big uh, thing of other places. Like, oh, this is just watery tasting. It's thin, right? And theirs has that mouthfeel of a stout of a. It's actually Asian got IPA. a body to it, right? It's got a body to it. It's like, oh, this is great. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. So again, if you're interested, that's the kind of twist I'm doing my, this year is I'm I'm throwing a workout into my all beer diet. And this is going to be, once I get this, my new morning uh, protein shake breakfast, essentially. Nice. So that'll be the thing. Um, Molson Coors, uh, we, I, you guys talked about possible uh, cease and desist. Well, they're actually going to settle a class action possible lawsuit with the company Vizzy. Uh, with their brand Vizzy, sorry, um, but it's only at the uh sum of nine point five million with a, a company like Molson Coors, it's like a drop in a bucket. That that's cost um, to do in business. Yeah, that's just cost to do in business because of the misleading aspect of them stating, and I believe we talked about this on the show. Of uh, they had antioxidant antioxidants and vitamin C and with super fruit into their uh, alcoholic beverages, hard seltzers. Um, so if you did purchase this, uh, this that's what they're proposing. That this is sounding like this is probably going to go through. You can get fifteen dollars back. You know, uh, it's basically the equivalent of like seventy five cents per can instead of your standard ten percent. Whoop de do. Um, so now you know the cost of business, and don't believe every advertisement you read yeah um you know when when you go into that local grocery store it's like all the organic this and it's like i'm pretty sure this is from a big box place 
yeah yeah what is all organic yeah you know um all that stuff so 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 be wary of that type of stuff so but if you did buy that and you want you know i think the maximum they're saying you get back is like uh 75 dollars yeah um <laughs> so but if you want your, if you want a little bit of money back i actually was in part of a class action lawsuit or i got my money back from a couple of kegs i bought i got i think it was like 50 bucks back yeah Four years after my tap room closed. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> that, 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 I felt that one. I was like, thank you did, so did, much. Did you go buy a $50 keg with it? Because that's what I would have done. <laughs> I, I should have. You should I have. I really should have. Right. It was, it was the two towns uh, suit. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. All um, right. Yeah, I bought two towns. Uh, and I think the last thing we're going to cover tonight is the development studio Obsidian. You may know them from works such as... I want to know Fallout New Vegas, uh, the Outer yeah. Worlds. Uh, they want to do that again. Uh, they want to make a Fallout New Vegas remastered, uh, according to some recent interviews with the development team. Uh, they've been talking about uh, further development on the Outer Worlds, and uh, the production director, Eric DeMilt, said that the team would love to give New Vegas a facelift, noting the game had significant technical problems at launch. And I think that is putting it fairly mildly if you played Fallout New Vegas yesterday. Uh, it is not a technical masterpiece in any way, shape, or form, but it is one of the favorite of the Fallout series from series fans. Uh, I'm not huge on remakes remasters that kind of thing unless it is truly remastered and made anew um don't give me the same exact gameplay give me all of the quality of life enhancements that we've learned over the last 10 to 15 years give me more story or more expansion or something other than being able to play through the game again just with updated visuals and and more stability yeah. don't give me I, Link's awakening for the nintendo switch and charge me 40 dollars for the privilege of playing a game boy game you made in 1991 like yeah that's bs well to be honest and i i agree with you but i did buy the remasters of monkey island uh so uh and, and, and i and it was it was it was a straight just cross but again but those were those like were only it. 20 bucks and yeah and and so uh, they weren't they weren't triple a title cost right and 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 i'm okay with that but don't expect me to be dropping 60 bucks on we remade fallout new vegas and you literally made it in the same engine or yeah you know ugh, like <laughs> I have a hard time now with now with ray tracing on over the exact same graphics <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah great now it crashes every three minutes and i only get 30 fps swell yep yeah uh i i can't necessarily say i'm dying to see this um but i know a certain number of fans would be uh they'd also like to discuss with microsoft at some point in the future a hypothetical new vegas 2 uh so yeah, who knows? We we may be getting another Fallout revisiting the Vegas saga or a remaster of New Vegas itself. Uh, both of which I would probably buy and play. It, it's hard for me to pass up a Bethesda published RPG. I, I play them all. They're always great. Um, but man, I feel like I would be less inclined to play that one if it's just a remake. Yep. Yep uh all right uh cool cool uh john jay says nintendo 3ds online game shop closing soon download all those games while you can that's assuming you haven't already mm. hacked your previous generation console and already have yep. your full rom library of them not that i know anyone well who we don't do condone that, that here not, not that, that i know here. anyone who would do anything do like that such a thing no once a console goes end of life, I feel it's free game, but that's me. Uh, anyway, 
it is 10 past the hour. John, any closing thoughts? Any, uh, uh do you need anyone no, to just... keep an eye on your health? Do you have like Twitter monitoring your heart rate or some crap? <laughs> uh i i got i got my app i got my breathalyzer so i'm gonna be doing if you guys ever saw my channel or what i did last year which is a bit more extreme yeah. uh this year i'm doing a little less extreme but a lot more data uh i have pre-blood work coming mm -hmm. uh i got my steps in i have a breathalyzer to track to make sure i'm still sober uh so people know that or like you know what what happens um, and I'm trying to do more shorts in between, so you'll want to check that out. Uh, this is supposed to be more of an easy, something that's uh, a bit more maintain, uh, main uh, you can maintain a little bit longer, right? Than uh, a standard suffering through 46 days. You know, you, you can still enjoy the fruits of life, but uh, maybe lose a little bit of weight at the same time and still have a beer. Yeah. So if if something like that sounds interesting. Take a look at this month at March, um, but I do I do miss cocktails. I'll tell you that I drank the last of my house whiskey last night. Wow! To be all, I mean, I have plenty here, but my house whiskey, which is in the house, yeah, house whiskey, uh, <laughs> yes, is is now gone. So I had to get through that, and I was like, oh, I have I have no more. Oh well. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been episode 274 of Talking Heads. Make sure to join us every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time for the latest in beer and cocktail and tech news. Uh, subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Subscribe to Hops and Brews if you are at all interested in the beer diet and how it treats him over the month. I'm sure we will all get plenty of updates on that as well as results at the end. And I'm definitely curious now that you've got more data coming in and going out what it's actually going to look like as far as like an overall health picture. So very yeah. interesting. That, that That's what I wanted to hit more. Yeah. So. Uh, anyway, thank you all so much for watching. As always, we will see you next week. Cheers, everyone. See you guys.